Amen. Well, we uh, are taking a diversion from our series on Acts. We'll get back to Acts in uh, January, but before Advent, we thought the, the three Sundays we have remaining before Advent would be a great opportunity for us to, to do a short sermon series on something else. And so uh, what we've decided to focus on is joy, uh, particularly uh, the expansive joy of God. The first week will be on the Father, the second week will be on the Son, and the third week will be on the Holy Spirit. Um, so let's just jump right into it so I don't uh, explain my preaching time away. Would you please bow your heads? as I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. And just just that song we just heard sung and that we sang together, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for delighting in us. You are unlike all the other gods in that you are not impassable or unmovable, but you came as close as you could possibly come to us through Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit to make your home with us. And for that, we give you thanks. So now during this time of preaching, Lord, I ask that you would draw nearer to us by your Holy Spirit, open up our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, and enable us to become willing to do your will so that we can emerge from this place as people who've been transformed by a loving and joyful God. Do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. As I was preparing this movie, um, I was listening, well, this is no surprise. I've been listening to Christmas music since July. Um, and it's because Christmas music is probably the best kind of music out there. And so, as you guys often know, because of uh, my, my um, love for the song, The Little Drummer Boy, whenever I listen to certain kind of music, it, it prompts certain memories and then it shows up in my sermons on Sunday. Well, today, or this past week, as I was thinking about this sermon, uh, the thing that popped up into my memory was that movie, Home Alone, because this is the season where they're going to start showing all the great Christmas uh, movies. And so I was thinking about Home Alone in terms of the expansive joy of God. Now, how do those things connect? I'll show you. And if it's a stretch, then, you know, you can exercise forgiveness on me. But in Home Alone, the first uh, two Home Alones, I hear there's another one coming out, but in Home Alone, uh, there's, there are two characters in, in the first two movies, they're almost, well, the movies have the same premise. They're very similar, but they're similar to a degree where it's like the, the uh, producer and the director, they followed a similar template on how they're going to make the movie, how they're going to solve the problem, who's going to be a catalytic figure, uh, et cetera. And in both of the movies, there are two figures that really stand out as catalytic uh, characters that um, once the main character, Kevin, realizes something about them, the entire movie changes. Uh, those figures are Old Man Marley and the Homeless Pigeon Lady. Now, Old Man Marley, which I think is a fantastic name. You know, the older I get, I'm going to want a nickname. I would take Old Man Marley as a great nickname. But I wouldn't take the association they had of thinking that he was rumored to be the South Bend shovel slayer, you know? They thought that he was a serial killer that had um, somehow killed a lot of people and then decomposed their bodies in his basement. So naturally, all the kids in the neighborhood were afraid of him. And so as the first movie uh, continues, we see Kevin McAllister being afraid of old man Marley and then eventually having a confrontation with old man Marley that leads him to realize that he's actually not a serial killer. He's just a lonely man. He's a nice man, but he's lonely, he's normal, he's kind, he's generous, and as he discovers, he's helpful. And there is, there is something about discovering something about uh, old man Marley that when Kevin's perspective on him changed, all of a sudden Kevin's the way Kevin functioned in reality changed. He had a lot more boldness and courage, et cetera. And the same thing with uh, the homeless pigeon lady. She was viewed as sick because she hangs out with pigeons all day. And I remember one scene in particular where Kevin was really repulsed by her. 
really repulsed. I mean, just a repugnant figure, and his reaction to her uh, betrayed his feelings until all of a sudden he realized that instead of trying to do him harm, she came and tried to help him. And once he made this discovery that she actually wasn't repugnant, but she was kind, again, in the second movie, that was kind of the shift uh, towards Kevin becoming this figure with immense character and responsibility and an intense desire to do the right thing. So you see, there's something about seeing objectively that leads us to function in society, in reality, in a much more harmonious way than we'd be accustomed to. When we see things objectively, it creates this uh, experience of functioning with reality in a harmonious way. And I think we can all attest to that. Uh, some people, you know people in your lives who just have a, um, an unapproachable look on their face. Does anybody know someone like that? Okay, you guys are so kind and generous. No one raised their hand, you know. But when, when Pastor Caleb was here, there's the joke that we always had. Because uh, we'd, we'd talk like, hey, uh, have you heard any complaints in the church? And I always, I'd always say, no, I haven't heard anything. Things must be going well. Then he'd say, well, man, I got a few to tell you about. And we figured maybe it's because he has a more approachable face than I do. So you all know someone who doesn't look like they want to hear your complaints, namely this guy. And it is true. So if you have complaints now, you can direct them towards this guy because he has a much more approachable face than I do. So we all have people in our lives like that. We know we've all had bosses that they appear to be mean, right? But when we get to know them, they're just stretched, they're just stressed out, just stretched too thin. We know that kids, kids aren't, um, most kids aren't quiet. If you have kids, you know that kids aren't quiet. But in public, why are they quiet? Because they're terrified. They're, all these gigantic human beings are walking around them. So if when we're able to um, see objectively and understand what's really going on, it helps us live in, harmo in harmony with a person who doesn't seem approachable, with the boss that just seems stressed out, with the kid that's just terrified because they're surrounded by giants who are, are looming over them. Now, if that's true of human beings and the relationships we have with one another, how much more true would it be of God? How much more true would it be about God? See, what, what we think about when we think about God impacts our experience not only of God, not only of religious things, but about everything. It impacts our experience of life altogether. As uh, A.W. A. Tozer, he was a famous preacher back in the, the um, early or the mid-1900s, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, why is that the case? That's the case because what we think about God shapes the way we are in the world because God encompasses the world. So what comes into our minds when we think about God is really important because it shifts the trajectory of life that we're on. Now, if that's true, it's important for us to ask the question, what is our popular perception about God? What do we as a people think about God? What do I as an individual think about God? So how is God popularly perceived? And why don't you guys help me out with some answers? How is God popularly perceived in our world? Just shout some stuff out. God is? Say it again. I can't hear you. Accepting? Okay. Okay. Someone else? All powerful? On his throne? Okay, high and exalted? Loving? Edmund said he looks like George Burns. I don't know who that is, but we'll, we'll allow it, okay? Now, what just happened is you guys gave the right answers, right? You guys gave the right answers about God, but how do people interact with God? Hmm? Are most people's lives the kind of lives that are filled with faith that God will supply? When the towers fell, what did people say about God? Where was God? Why would God allow? If God were good. So you see, we know the right answers to say about God because we've been trained. We're Christians. We attend church. 
in Bible study. But when you look at not what the right answers are, but what the beliefs that govern our lives really are, most people's beliefs about God are negative beliefs about God. God isn't trustworthy. God isn't good. God isn't kind. God isn't near to those who are brokenhearted. Those are the beliefs that really uh, govern the way we live our lives. And we know, see, see, knowing the right answers, but believing something else, if that's the case, you're always going to fall in line with what you really believe. In the same way, we all know that most bugs in our house are harmless, completely harmless. But what happens when that spider all of a sudden lands on your arm, right? I mean, you almost break a limb trying to stand up fast enough to get the thing off of you, right? Your knowledge that it's harmless is overridden by your belief that it's frightening, it's scary. That's how it is when we think about God. Our beliefs about God are what really governs our lives, not the things we know to be true, not the right answers we know to be correct. And so this is how it is with God. For several millennia, we've been taught the right answers about God, but in functionality and in actuality, what we've received is this view of a God that is impassable. I mean, expand uh, beyond the Judeo-Christian religions. Think about the deities in all other religions, from the Greek gods to the gods in India. All of these other gods, they're viewed as gods that will turn you into a spider if you cross their paths if you don't bow down low enough. The God of the Bible is such a, stickler for, uh, such a stickler for doing things the right way that he creates rules like the Ten Commandments. See, what we've been taught growing up and what we've been taught historically and from religious leaders throughout the ages is that God is good and loving and compassionate, etc. But the real lesson we've received about God is that God is a stickler, God is a rules person, God is someone who you don't want to annoy. And those are the beliefs that begin to govern our minds. And it's not just the religious teachings, but it's also our, our personal interactions with people who are like God to us. Who are the people who are like God to us? Well, our parents, all of our leaders, teachers, coaches, etc. And if you have a parent or a coach or a teacher that's overbearing or that's always on you about doing things just the right way, then without even thinking about it, you're going to begin to understand, well, God is like that too. And if I, if I screw up just once, God is going to be so angry. So our experience is not only in the religious sector, but our experience is with those who are above us in leadership, those who are like God to us. If those are negative, they're going to give us a negative framework about God. And with this kind of subjective understanding governing our minds, um, our understanding of and our relationship with God will be severely limited, severely limited. Dallas Willard has an amazing quote about this. He says, the role of the taskmaster whether a pleased one or an angry one, is a role that God accepts only when appointed to it by our own limited understanding. He thus often condescends to us because of our consciousness, because our consciousness cannot rise any higher, clouded as, as it is by our experiences in a fallen world with our superiors, whether they be parents, bosses, kings, or those who stand over us in manipulative love. And the rule then, as always is, let it be done for you according to your faith. Well, no doubt it's better that we have some relationship to God than no relation at all. So what's he saying? He's saying if we understand God as a tyrant, God is actually so desirous to have a relationship with us that sometimes our only experience of God will be a tyrannical experience. Not because that's how God is, but because God wants to be close to us, and that's how we'll allow him to be. That's, that's the only way we'll allow ourselves to experience him. So it's, it's going to be important for us to remove the subjective view and try to gain an objective view of who God is. In fact, there's a scripture in the Bible, if you remember the parable of the talents, right? Remember, there's three servants, and the master's going on a trip, and so he leaves these three servants huge sums of money. 
and tells them to invest in it until he returns. Remember the first two servants, what did they do? They immediately went off and started investing, right? And their investment made a return. And when the master came back, the master said, well done, good and faithful servants. Listen to what Jesus said that he said after that. Enter into the joy of your master. So what's the master like? Full of joy. But the third servant, remember what he, did, he said? The third servant also received a huge sum of money. But what did he do with it? He went and dug it, and dug it and hid it in the ground. And then when he came to his master, what did his, he say to his master? Master, I knew you to be a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow. And so, look, here's your money. I dug it in the ground. Forgive the dirt that's on it, but here, you can take it back. It's exactly what you gave me. How did he see his master? Harsh. But how was his master in actuality? Full of joy. So his perspective impacted his experience, and, and our perspective of God will impact our experiences. So we have to move away from this subjective thing where we see God because of certain indicators in our lives and move towards seeing God as God reveals himself to be. So how do we do that? Well, if we see God in Scripture without the filters, when we read our Bible without the filters, we'll discover that God actually is not a curmudgeonly uh, person, but God is good and loving and merciful and patient and joyful. Now, of course, if you read Scripture, you'll realize that there's a certain kind of intensity about God that makes it seem like he's unapproachable because God is ferociously joyful and ferociously loving and ferociously good, but good nonetheless. There are no negative qualities about God. In fact, if I can suggest something uh, to you guys to just hold on to you in your minds, it would be this one piece of advice. Never think anything bad about God. Never think anything bad about God. Never allow the thought to cross your mind when you're reading Scripture, man, God did something bad there. Instead, allow yourself to ask the question, how can I understand this differently? Because I know that God is not bad. God cannot be bad. Never think anything about God. Instead, come to see God as he's truly revealed in Scripture. So let's just look at a few instances in Scripture to see what God is like. The first thing we find out when we open the Bible is that God is creative. In the beginning, God created. God created. God created. What is creation? Creation is an act of joy. When your kids or your grandkids run up to you with a thing they made in Sunday school or a picture they made for you, what, what's on their face? Is it usually a frown? Is it usually like hair? <laughs> you know? No, it's, it's usually a smile, right? They're usually delighted. Why? Because they made something for you. Creation is an act of joy. And so when we read in, in the first uh, chapter in the Bible, in verse 4, 10, 12, 17, 21, 25, and 31, we have God looking at his creation and saying, man, this is good. This is good. God was joyful. He was happy. And, and if you think that creation is a child, of, is a, a, a creation um, is one of the expressions of joy, and a little kid can experience joy when they create how much more will the creator of everything we see around us be filled with joy? Don't think the thought that God is in heaven with a frown on his face. He's the most joyful being in the entire universe. All of our joy combined doesn't even approach the joy of the Lord. Creation is an act of joy. Close relationships uh, to, to us, when we want to know what someone is really like, we can talk to someone who knows them. If you want to know what I'm really like, probably talk to Ashanti, and then you'll get the real picture, right? She knows me the most. So if we want to know what God is really like, who knows God the most? Jesus. Remember Peter said, or, or it was Thomas who said, um, show us the Father. And, and then Jesus said to Thomas, um, 
how long have you been with me, Philip? Not Thomas, Philip. He said, I've been with you for, for such a long time and you don't know? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So what's, what's Jesus essentially saying? God is like me. God is exactly like me. In fact, there's a quote by a preacher named Brian Zahn. He says, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We've not always known what God is like, but now because of Jesus, we do. So that's another way of knowing who someone is like. It's talking to the person that knows them the most. And if we talk to the person that knows them the most, we might see some examples that this person gives us of what the other person is like. So consider what Jesus had to say about God. Remember in Luke chapter 15, it's one of the best chapters in the entire New Testament. Jesus tells three stories that reveal to us what God is like. A lady loses a coin and she sweeps her entire house until she finds it. And when she finds it, she starts calling all her friends to say, hey, remember that coin that I was missing? I got it. Come on over and have a party. Jesus says that's what God is like whenever a sinner returns home. He throws a party. He also tells a story about a, a shepherd that loses one sheep, and the shepherd leaves the 99 to go, and find all the, the, to go and find this lost sheep, and when the shepherd brings the sheep home, what happens? It's party time. And then he tells a story about a father that had two sons. One of the sons left and made a wreck of himself, and when the son came home beaten down and broken and smelling like pigs, the father runs to him and embraces him, and what does he do? He throws a party. Jesus is saying, my father will find any reason whatsoever to throw a party. That's what God is like. That's what God is like. All these and more should shape our understanding of who the God of heaven is. Because the one that knows him the most says, he's like me. And then he tells stories to reveal he's not a curmudgeon. He's not waiting for you to sin so that he can send lightning bolts to strike you. He's waiting to celebrate each and everything that you do. I hope it's not inappropriate to say that God's a party animal. He's more like that than the judgmental figure that we've come to know. So this knowledge, as it invades our mind, it should enable us to be different people. You know, when I started to, to come to grips with this idea of, of God, not as a God that's, that when I come to him, he's like, oh man, here comes Meshach again. I bet he's going to confess that same sin all over again. It's been 15 years and he still can't get over, over lying and stealing and killing people. I wasn't, I don't come to God and confess <laughs> killing people regularly. Um, but that's not what God is like. That's not what God is like. God actually rejoices when he sees us coming. God delights in us. So all these things from Scripture, all these things from Scripture point to us a God that is full of joy and full of goodness, full of love. And with this view in place, the next thing that we'll continually need to do is fight against those old ideas that will try to invade our mind, that will try to creep back in. Just like the old ideas in, in Home Alone when he saw the old man, I'm sure the thought that he's actually a scary old man began to invade his mind again. So we'll have to instead look to our experiences and look to what's been revealed to us and say, no, God is not like that. God is actually good and joyful and loving and kind. And this is going to require us to be thoughtful, not judgmental, but thoughtful. I read a quote by uh, Carl Jung earlier this week. He said, thinking is difficult. Therefore, let the herd pronounce judgment. In other words, since thinking is difficult, most people just go about their days making all these judgments. But we're not most people. We are the people of God. And we're going to have to let thinking be the thing that leads us to understanding. And so as we read Scripture, we're going to have to think deeply about the God that's being revealed to us in Scripture. And as we think deeply about the God being revealed to us in Scripture, we can live accordance with that revelation of who God is and what God is like. Let me read to you this quote 
is quoted by a man named William Law from a short book called Paternus, Advice to a Son. He writes to his son, first of all, my child, think magnificently of God. Think magnificently of God. Magnify his presence or his providence. Adore his power. Pray to him frequently and incessantly. Bear him always in your mind. Listen to this part. Teach your thoughts to reverence him in every place. This is something that you do. Teach your thoughts to reverence him in every place, for there is no place where he is not. Therefore, my child, fear and worship and love God. First and last, think magnificently of him. Think magnificently of God. This is something that we train our minds to do. See, when when Charles Wesley was making hymns while his brother John was preaching, Charles Wesley decided, I'm going to use these common tunes that most people are familiar with. But instead of having the common words that are degrading and stuff like that, I'm going to add magnificent words about God. So that as people walk down the street humming a song, they'll just find themselves humming, how deep the Father's love for us. Now, what's better to hum that or to hum some of the other stuff that's out there? Hmm? What's better, to walk around um, humming the popular music today or walk around training your mind to think magnificently of God? Have you ever done that? Have you ever trained your mind to think magnificently of God? The answer is yes. Every Sunday when you come to church, every time you go to Bible study, every time you read your Bible, every time you praise God, you're telling yourself, God is magnificent. Think magnificently of him. I read another quote that was a lot more simple, but I think was equally profound. This is from a blogger, a lady named Emily Freeman. She said, God is not only good, he's also not bad. Now that's, have you ever thought about that? I never thought about that. Because all of us, as uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, the good and evil runs right through all of us. And so we're used to saying, I'm, oh, you know, so-and-so's a good person. But we also know some bad things that they did. But when it comes to God, God is not only good, he's also not bad. It struck me like lightning, like, yeah, that is profoundly true. God is not bad at all. There's not one bad characteristic that God has, for he is good, he is joyful. And so to wrap up this sermon, I want to show you what God commanded the priests in the Old Testament to do so that people can think magnificently of him. This is a benediction, the ironic blessing. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Now, this is what God is doing. He's telling them, when you're given a blessing to the Israelites, I want you to say this. So pay attention to what God wants them to say. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Now let me just mention a few things about this. Who initiates the blessing? God does. What does that say about God? He's the God that desires blessings for people. He's the God that desires good things for people. And he's a God that wants us to see that he's the kind of God that desires good things for other people. He's a generous and and beneficent God. What else do we learn about this? He's a God that protects them. Look Look at what it says. The Lord bless you and keep you. Keep you from what? Anything that wants to do you harm outside of my providence. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. What does that mean? What does it mean the Lord make his face shine on you? Well, if you've ever been around an infant, you know what it means. There's almost like a a chemical reaction that when older people see little tiny babies, their faces shine on them. 
parents with newborns experience it all the time. You go in a room and the parents just start talking about the kid. Sometimes you feel like, am I even here, you know? I exist too, you know? But what's happening? Their faces are so drawn to this little child and and it's shining upon them and they're willing goodness upon this child. Well, God says, the Lord will make his face shine on you. So think the thought right now, when God sees me, his face is radiant with joy. Isn't that terrifying? God's face radiates joyfully when he sees me. Just let that hang over you for a while. God's face is joyful when he sees you. Hmm? This isn't the religion of the Pharisees who prayed and thanked God that I'm not like other men because I've done all these nice things. This is the religion of the publican who drops down on his knees and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, the publican went home justified that day. Why? Because God's face smiled on him. God is eager to fill our lives with his joy and peace. Why? Because he's bursting with joy. He has so much that he wants to extend it to others. Indeed, why did God create everything he created? Not because he needed to. He was completely content with it just being him. But why did he create? Because he was bursting with love and peace and goodness and kindness and mercy and joy. And he wanted other people, other beings to enter into it. God's joy is expansive. I want to put that quote up by William Law one more time and have that be the close of my sermon today. Because if we were to do this, all of a sudden the way we get through the world would be changed fundamentally. First of all, my sisters and brothers, think magnificently of God. Magnify his providence adore his power, pray to him frequently and incessantly, bear him always in your mind. Teach your thoughts to reverence him in every place, for there is no place where he is not. Therefore, my child, my sisters and brothers, fear and worship and love God. First and last, think magnificently of him. To our magnificent God, We come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who revealed you perfectly. He revealed you perfectly. And what he revealed was not an angry God, a curmudgeonly God, a judgmental God, but he revealed a God that is good. So much so that we don't have the words to to describe what you're truly like. Our vocabulary is failing in in that regard. Lord, we want to experience you as you really are. Forgive us for the ways in which we present to others a false view of who you are and enable us by your sheer goodness to enter into the world as people who've been liberated because of the knowledge and the belief and the experience of God as good, as joyful. That way, when people see your children walking into the world, they'll see children who have smiles on their face because they are the children of an almighty, magnificent, joyful God. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside each and every one of us, making that possible for Jesus' sake, for our salvation, and that the world may come to know who you are, we pray. Amen. You may begin getting your communion elements ready and musicians you can get in place.